Hi, everyone. How's it going? Good. Yeah, that's it. Yay. Um, all right. As the slide says, I'm Molly. Um, and what I'm here to talk to you guys about today is uh, what I like to call the nine things I wish someone had told me in 2007. Um, this is uh, basically a list of everything I wish someone had told me before I started in a series of experiences about three or four companies of uh, building companies, building teams, and scaling companies, and scaling teams. So it comes from about three or four places. I started at Google actually in 2007 and was there for a year and a half. Um, and then I moved on to Facebook. Um, and I was there for about four and a half years. I started in 2008 when we were 500 people and 80 million users. And I left in 2012, um, at the end of 2012, just after we went public. And we were 5,500 people and 1.25 billion users. Um, so a lot of lessons that I'm going to talk about today come from that experience as well as a couple others I'll talk about. Um, at Facebook, I basically had two jobs, um, two sections to my time there. I spent two and a half years in HR and recruiting, working on, uh, for lack of a better explanation, uh, employment branding and culture. And then I spent two and a half years, believe it or not, helping figure out our long-term mobile strategy. Um, so very different experiences. One of the early lessons I learned at Facebook is that job descriptions don't last very long when you are scaling. They basically expire about 14 seconds after you take the job. So the way that I have always thought about jobs since then um, is actually as questions that you need to answer. So uh, a lot of folks that work with me, I talk about the questions um, that are sort of like define your job. Um, so my sections had two uh, to sort of, well, there are two governing questions to the first one and one governing question to the second. The first two were, how do we talk to the world outside about what it's like to work at Facebook? This was long, long, long before we were comfortable using the word hacker, so that was a fun adventure. Um, and then who do we want to be when we grow up, which is actually what Mark said to me at some point. Um, and then the second section, that second two and a half years, I, my governing question was, how do we um, end up being more than just an application on somebody else's operating system. Lots of fun adventures and stories in that two and a half years. My second big experience actually came from a startup called Quip. So I left Facebook and I wanted to learn what it took to build something from nothing. For anybody that has been through this experience before, it is a very exciting and extremely different experience in lots of ways than actually scaling a company. You are fighting to survive, you're fighting for people to give a shit about you, um, and it is a, a highly interesting and emotional experience. So I joined Quip uh, when we were about nine people. I joined three months before we launched. I helped launch the startup. My title was Chief Operating Officer, but FYI, that title can mean a lot of different things. So I basically did all the first sales, launched the product, launched the company, um, got all of our first sort of 100 or 150 customers, and then um, ended up hiring sales and marketing leaders and, and um, growing the company over time. We sold Quip, um, which is a, um, it's a living documents that help your team work uh, faster and, and better together. We were um, partners with Slack. Um, so we sold that last year to Salesforce for about $750 million. And I left. Um, so I had a full range of startup experiences in there. Um, and what I call the baby startup phase, the, like I said, the phase where you're starting to fighting to exist. And what I do today is I work at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. I run operations, um, which I also have questions that govern that job. I'm trying to figure out who we are and how we do things. CZI is a philanthropic organization that Mark Zuckerberg and Priscilla Chan started um, that is essentially trying to use technology to solve some of the world's hardest problems. We do not have another organization in the world that we can model ourselves after, after. So a lot of what I do every day is try to figure out how we do things and how we make decisions uh, and how we run the place. Um, so CZI has grown enormously. Most people think we're like 10 people. Uh, we've, I started, we were 40 people. We are now 175 people. So we've grown, and I've, I've been there about eight months. So we've grown enormously. CZI, every day, I use a, every tool in my toolkit, every experience I have from Facebook and Quip, um, trying to wrestle this amazing organization into um, the best thing that it can be. And what I want to talk about today is that toolkit. So what am I using at, at CZI? What have I learned over this period of time that may or may not be valuable to you guys in the organizations that you help um, run and grow? Um, all right, nine things. Number one, building and scaling companies is really fucking hard. <laughs> it may sound obvious, 
But this stuff is hard in really unexpected ways. I think a lot, like when I left Facebook and went to Quip, I was like, oh, it'll just be like a really intense startup experience and I'll work all the time. And one of the most fascinating things was that the hardest thing about Quip wasn't the number of hours I put in, it was how emotional it was to be building something from nothing. Um, as many of you or some of you may know, uh, one of my metaphors uh, for building and scaling organizations is these Lego sculptures. Um, Somebody just asked me where this came from, and it's actually something I started using long ago at Google, but I think of it as kindergartners sharing Legos. So let me explain. When you first start and you get the privilege of scaling or building a team, it's exciting. There's so many Legos. There's, you, there's so much opportunity and so many things to build. And then at some point, panic sets in. There's too many Legos. I have too much to do every day. I'm working all the time. No one person can possibly do all of this. Um, I need help. And so you go and you hire people. Then a very interesting thing happens, which is that you get scared. You get anxious, you get nervous, you get territorial, you get frustrated. Um, I, I always say that when people on my team come to me and say, what's that job that we're hiring for that's like loosely related to my job? I'm like, OK, let's talk. I understand. Um, this can lead to one of two places, both dependent on you and the organization that you're a part of. In well-run organizations where people learn to share their Legos, to give away their Legos, to go on and move and build another part of the Lego sculpture, um, you end up being able to build more and build better. In bad organizations, or if you let these emotions govern, you end up with much more exciting situations where people or organizations entirely can actually uh, reduce progress as a whole because they haven't learned how to not let the emotions win. I think one of the most counterintuitive things about scaling when you first start going through it is the fact that adding more people doesn't actually make less work for you. What it does is enable the entire company to do more. Um, scaling particularly when you're going through really rapid growth, actually means giving away your job with some amount of consistency. I got so good at this at Facebook that I literally just started doing it at, like by rote. I was constantly looking for the person that was going to take my job because we were just growing and scaling so fast. It is a very insecure making experience, um, but it is a really important literal skill to learn as you grow and scale organizations and teams. One thing I just want to call out is the difference between, for example, my experience at Facebook and my experience at Quip. So they both have some similarities where, you know, at Facebook and at Quip, there's this moment of just delight of like, oh, Legos, like there's so many Legos, it's so exciting, it's so fun, we want everyone to feel like it feels like this all the time. At Facebook, I would say there was a lot more experiences like this, where there's just too much to do um, and too many Legos, and, but this constant feeling of just like insecurity and fear about somehow eventually becoming irrelevant by giving your job away all the time. At Quip, well, there were lots of experiences like this, and I think one of the things you do when you're building startups is you walk around telling everybody that it always feels like this, but the truth is the vast majority of the time it actually feels like this, uh, where there's sheer terror and a sense of potential irrelevance for the entire company um, at all times. So um, three things just related to this, and then I'll give you point number two. Number one, one of the main, things I, one of the main reasons I talk about this, um, both internally and externally, is it's going to be OK. This is normal. Um, the fact that the process of hiring really extraordinary people who logically should have no reason to work for you um, is, makes you feel insecure is actually incredibly normal. Um, the challenge is uh, not letting it own you, not letting the insecurity, the emotions, the fear, all of those things own you, and actually realizing there's just a cycle to it. You can cycle from excitement to fear, back to, to like boredom, back to loneliness, back, back, to, back to excitement. Uh, and that's actually part of the process and part of the experience. The second is, you just got to lean into it, man. Like, embrace the suck. Like, it is, that cycle is normal, and that means that you just got to learn how to manage it for yourself um, and realize that it is part of what is so exciting about um, building and scaling organizations. And the third is get really job good at giving your job away. I will talk more about this throughout this presentation, but 
the act of giving your job away is actually one of the things that can make you successful inside rapidly scaling organizations. Um, and it is incredibly insecure making, but also extremely important to your own ability to grow. Um, all right, point number two. Your only job inside of scaling organizations is to learn and grow as fast as you possibly can. So I talk a lot about this graph because a lot of technology companies in particular have a graph like this. This at Facebook was the monthly active user graph. We obsessed about it as a company. It was always our top line goal for a long time. Now they've changed that metric. But there's always a metric that you're obsessively staring at. At Slack, it might be team growth. For some companies, it's revenue. But there's a graph that you orient the whole company around. This is the process of growing our users. But one of the things that I think is really important to understand is this is also how fast your company is changing. Um, this is how fast the world around you is evolving. One of the most fascinating things about this graph is that literally what it indicates is that if you were the highest performer at the company in 2008, if you did not grow, if you did not change and evolve with the company, you would have been underwater one year later. You could have been the lowest performer at the company one year later because you were working inside a different company. Um, and that is really important to internalize because it leads to sort of the, one of the biggest principles, which is that it doesn't matter what you know today. The question is how fast you can change. The question is how fast you can learn and grow and evolve. Um, like I said, the second is uh, that, that rate of change and the sort of fast growth you think you're sitting inside a pile of Legos that looks like this. It's manageable. It's exciting. It's a little terrifying. It's manageable. The reality inside scaling organizations is that you're actually sitting in something that looks like this. You think the person you just hired is senior enough. Usually they're not. Because they saw, particularly if they, what they do is manage what exists today. The point is the Lego pile is about seven times larger than you actually think it is. The only constant inside these organizations is change. It is extremely humbling as a manager and as a team builder to realize that you're almost always behind. You thought you hired the right person, you thought you built a big enough team, and all of a sudden seven more needs show up that you couldn't have anticipated if you've never been through this before. And even speaking as someone that's been through this before, sometimes you still can't anticipate it. I, CCI has taught me all sorts of things uh, that I did not uh, anticipate. Um, Again, the constant is change. The constant is that whatever you're doing today, it's not going to work in some number of months, in some organizations, in some number of weeks. That became very true at Facebook through a certain period where literally it was like a different company every three weeks. Um, and in some organizations, it's longer than that. It's every six months. I would love that pace. We've got a, about a four-week cadence right now going at CCI. Um, but it is important to realize that how fast things change and how fast things grow and how fast things evolve. One of my governing words at Facebook um, and has stayed with me, I'm about ready to get a tattoo for it, is useful. So a lot of times when I sit down and talk to people, they'll talk to me about what they want their career trajectory to look like, how they want to grow, why their title matters to them. And a lot of what I talk about is the fact that um, the truth is you're, what you come out of a, a, a scaling organization with is usually actually not a really fancy title that shows the world everything that you're capable of. What you come out of it with is stories. In the best case scenario, if you are the most useful in the person in the room at all times, you actually get all sorts of opportunities um, because people are like, oh, that person was really good and really useful. I'll just ask them to do this other thing too. Um, being useful is one of the best ways to navigate really rapidly scaling organizations that can't anticipate their own needs because you're useful. So when they find a need they didn't anticipate, they're just like, will you please solve this for us? Um, don't worry about your title. Focus on being useful. The rest will follow. You are part, if you are inside of one of these organizations or teams, of an incredible story. Eventually, you're going to be telling stories about how you built this tiger. And the ultimate actual asset that you walk out of these places with is the story of how you, part you started building the tiger's toe and you ended up helping figure out what his face looked like. Um, and that story is really hard to see when you're week by week getting tossed and turned in the waves of chaos. But if you look over the course of a year, three years, five years, you get to tell a story about how you helped or at least had a front row seat to building an extraordinary organization. 
Number three. This I am a professional at. You can learn anything if you are willing to sound like a complete and total moron. Um, so I've made three, two, at least two, um, more than that really, absolutely insane career leaps in my life. Um, they all seem extremely logical now, um, but the truth is most of the smartest people in my life told me not to do them. The first uh, was actually when I was in HR at Facebook and I had spent about two years there and someone asked me um, to come help us build a mobile phone. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? First of all, why are we doing that? Second of all, why the hell are you talking to me? Um, and the second one was actually when I left Facebook and went to Quip. Um, and I had done a huge number of things at Facebook, but I had never run sales before. I had never run the revenue side of a business before, and I definitely knew absolutely nothing about SaaS. And the thing that actually got me those opportunities, just to bring it back, is um, that there were people that I had been useful to on a project in the past, and they were like, I need help. I have to figure this out. Will you please come help me? So the skill that I use when I'm going to, for example, try to figure out the mobile ecosystem and for whatever, how you build a phone, what is hardware? Or like SaaS, what's in your recurring revenue? I don't know, how do you calculate it? Mm, I don't know, let's go find out. Um, is this, which is, um, this is a skill that I learned from a guy named Chris Cox, who's currently the head of product at Facebook. Um, and he was, when I started working for him, actually the head of HR and recruiting, but he originally joined the company as an engineer. Um, and he helped build Newsfeed, and then Mark asked him to run HR. Welcome to scaling companies. Um, and we would have all these people come in to try to give us advice about how you, know, how you run HR, and they would use all these acronyms, and they would tell us all these things, and it was like, and Chris would just sit there and he would say, he would literally be like, I don't understand what you're talking about. Can you please slow down and explain it to me? He had no ego about being like, sorry if this is a stupid question, but what do you mean? Or what does this mean? Or please unpack this word for me. Or can you explain that to me? Um, people are very, very willing to stop and explain things to you if you're willing to acknowledge that you sound like an idiot. Um, and it's, for me, has been one of the most powerful tools as I've navigated around and learned these entirely new industries and fields is that I at some point learned um, that you don't, number one, there's a huge amount of power in these questions because you think everybody around the table knows what they're, knows the answer and you're just the only idiot there that doesn't. And then you find out that nine people had the same question and or, which I'll get to in a second, everybody has a different answer, um, which is also really fascinating to discover. But the second is just that people will teach you. And it's one of the fastest ways for me to learn. Um, I've built huge relationships with wonderful, very talented engineers by just being like, I get this, this is a really dumb question, but what is middleware or something like that? Um, this brings me to my fourth point, though, which is be skeptical of words with more than one syllable. One of the things you find when you spend a lot of time traveling around teaching yourselves entire industries um, is that there's a lot of words that people use um, that they all think they know what they're talking about, um, or acronyms, et cetera, and actually everybody has a different definition. Um, one of the ways that I uh, found this out was actually when I was first starting at Facebook, um, and I was trying to rewrite our career site to explain how, uh, what we were like and, and what it was like to work at Facebook and who we were. And this again is before we were willing to use the word hacker, so there was, I was using a lot of other words. Um, and I went around and I read all the career sites for these other companies. At the time it was like Yahoo and Google and Dropbox and maybe somebody else, I can't remember, it was in 2008. And um, they all used like the same five words. It was like this come have impact, um, you like come be innovative um, and like fun and some other stuff. And I was just like, okay, well, if all of these companies are using the same five words, and this is a very diverse set of companies, these words have no meaning. If I say to you impact and it means, and Yahoo and Dropbox, which at the time was like a baby startup, were you both using it, how can this word possibly have meaning? So I developed this theory of what I call black hole words. This has been a fascinating journey for me where you think that everybody means the same thing when they say annual recurring revenue. When you actually dive into it, the way every company calculates it is slightly different. Um, let alone words that you all probably think are really obvious, like marketing or product management. And in actuality, when you start poking what does that mean, 
you find that everybody at the room is saying something, means something different. I call them black hole words because if two people can use the same word and mean something completely different, then it literally sucks everything out of the room. You can have an entire meeting and be like, black hole, like whatever, marketing, CMO, we need to hire a CMO, blah, 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 blah. And if nobody said, what do we mean by CMO or what do we mean by marketing, um, then you just agree, nobody agreed on anything. Um, this inside of scaling organizations is really important. Um, these words can um, obfuscate a lot of disagreement and, a lot of, and, and make you feel like you agreed and then everybody starts running in different directions. Um, like I said, I've, uh, I have a continually growing list of these things. Um, and, and for me, and, and folks that work with me know this, I spend a lot of time in meetings saying, what do you mean by that? Um, because it is very easy growth, great example. Marketing is my favorite one because when we went to search for a CMO at Quip, um, our amazing search firm basically sat me down and was like, okay, you have two options and you can't have both. Do you want brand or do you want what a lot of people would call a growth marketer, someone that's a funnel marketer that's focused on metrics? They were like, you can't have both. Um, but it was one of those moments where I was like, oh, right, everybody, everybody uses these words. And if we didn't ask the question, we would, might all have been looking for something different. Um, these are fun exercises to do with like friends and family, like what is a manager? What does that mean? What is that job actually? Um, unpacking them, I spent a huge amount of time unpacking the word performance reviews at Facebook, unpacking it and repackaging it, um, because it means something different to everyone. Um, unpack words, don't be afraid to ask stupid questions. Self-awareness is invaluable. This has come to be the number one characteristic that I hire for. Um, I look for people that know who they are. I look for people that can describe in extremely specific terms what they are extraordinary at. I don't want like, I'm good at attention to detail. I want like, I'm the best in the world at bringing people together and getting them to talk through hard issues or whatever. Um, the other piece of it though, is, oops, sorry, wrong way, is what you're bad at. Somebody at some point recently said to me, at some point in your career, you start looking for jobs that are shaped like you. You look for a molly-shaped hole. Um, and that comes, and I say this to a lot of folks that are early in their, in their like 20s or in their first five years of their career, the single most valuable thing you can do is figure out what you are extraordinary at and what you suck at and actually optimize for it. Look for jobs that make the best use of you and be okay with that. I am not the person, I literally walk into organizations and say this, I'm not the person you should hire if you want to scale a sales organization. That is the wrong job for me. There are people that are extraordinary at that. I am one of the best in the world at figuring things out. If you're like, we have a thing, it's really weird, it's kind of complicated, I don't know what it is, we need to figure it out, I'm like pretty good at that. Um, but I'm not the person that is deep on marketing, deep on sales, deep on whatever. Um, having your own version of that, whatever it is, will help you move both in life, but also inside of an organization that is growing and scaling that's offering you opportunities to give up your job every so often. It is far better than business school to navigate around these organizations and try things on. Um, try on who you are, try on what you're good at, learn what you're good at, don't be afraid of what you're bad at. Um, Sheryl Sandberg gave a talk at Airbnb a couple, uh, I think it was like two years ago now, and somebody asked her what she looks for in um, folks that are good at scaling and growing organizations, and she said people that ask for feedback. To me, it is exactly the same thing because it is fundamentally a growth mindset. People that are going to let themselves be humble let themselves say, like, I don't know how to do this, but give me a shot, or hey, I'm bad at this, or I suck at this, and I'm not gonna be the right person for that. People that are like, tell me what I'm bad at. I wanna know, I wanna try to get better, or I wanna know so I don't like go take an entire job that's composed of things I'm bad at. Um, you have to believe you need to grow to do well inside these organizations. This is my favorite lesson. Well, I have a lot of favorites, but the imposter syndrome is real. Do not let it eat you alive. It sounds simple. It is really intense to experience it. Um, 
The process of taking jobs that you are supremely unqualified for, which is what happens inside of scaling organizations, could not make you feel more insecure. It's part of that emotional roller coaster I talked about. Um, and everybody thinks that everybody else is like, got it. You know what I mean? It's like, that guy's got it. That lady's got it. And everybody is sitting around the table feeling like they probably don't belong there. I have spent the majority of my career feeling like I was failing, feeling like I was an idiot, feeling like everybody probably knew. Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge that because it's really important to understand that the people around you are probably feeling that way too inside of scaling organizations. That leads to two things. The first is, don't worry about it. The truth is you're actually probably the most qualified person for that job. Yeah, sure, there might be somebody that's got a really impressive resume that like has done it six times before, but you have all the context, you know the organization, you're probably just as good as that person for a whole host of other reasons, so go back to work. And number two is if your colleagues are acting weird, <laughs> if they're acting territorial, if they're acting insecure, it's possible it's because they're feeling this way too. I like to call them empathy sessions. Once in a while, it's okay to just sit someone down that's acting like a jerk to you all the time and just being like, what's going on, man? Have it out. Let's talk about it. But a lot of times it is driven by insecurity. Like I said, a lot of conversations that I've had in my past with folks that work for me started when someone was like, why are we hiring that person? Or like, I don't even understand what the marketing team does. But at the end of the day, what they're really saying is I'm worried I'm not going to be valuable anymore. And I'm worried I'm not qualified for anything. And I'm worried I'm feeling insecure. Like, please help me. And what I would do is sit down with them and say, okay, Number one, you're extremely important. It's really good for you to give away your job every six months or three months or two weeks. Um, it's going to be okay. You're going to feel the following way for the next three weeks. You're going to feel scared. You're going to feel insecure. You're going to feel territorial. You're going to want to take your job back. And then you're going to be bored. And then you're going to have a whole new job. And it's going to be really stressful. Um, so know that all of this is extremely normal. Number seven. Collect people who can teach you and ones who can keep you sane. The truth is, relationships are one of the most important things inside organizations that are changing all the time. At the end of the day, you don't have a job, and in some ways, you don't have a team because the team changes so much. What you are is a loose collection of people that are roughly trying to solve a problem. So, if you organize for the way things are today, if you build your relationships purely based on the three people that work for you and the five people that someone told you were important to your job, in three weeks or six months when everything changes, um, you've got a whole new team. Um, so one of the things that I talk a lot about is the fact that taking the time to get to know the people you work with, even people that are irrelevant currently to your job, and definitely people that are not powerful right now inside of the current power structure, um, is actually an extremely powerful tool. So these are my five things. And just so you know, these are also basically what I say when people ask me about networking or mentorship, um, so both internally to an organization and externally. Number one is lunch and coffee are extremely powerful tools. I used to do this a lot at Facebook where when I had a really good meeting with someone, I'd sit down with like the, and then we had like a really interesting dialogue or they were new. I'd be like, hey, do you want to go grab lunch at some point? And there was no point. It was just to get to know who they were. And then lo and behold, six months later, I'd end up working with them on something. And we had a basis to have a, like we had a relationship so that it was easier to work with them. That is also true outside of the, uh, in the world, which is like, they don't always have to have a point. You never know who's going to be useful to you in the long term. The second is, it's a barter economy. One of the worst things is when people only get in touch with you when they need things. This is true inside of companies. It's also true outside of companies. Do things for people. Be useful to them. Be helpful. It will pay back in spades over time. Don't just do things that people ask you to do. Don't just do the things that are really obvious that you need to do now. Help people. It, they will help you over time. The third is you never know who someone will become. Hopefully, this is really obvious. But number one, the admins run the company. Number two, the power structure that exists today will definitely be destroyed and put back together about six times. So 
uh, know that being good to people and being kind and civil is just good no matter who they are. But also, you never know how you're going to be able to help and, and help other people grow as they grow into leadership or positions and things like that. Um, and, and like I said, please don't just focus on people that are powerful. Um, it's generally, uh, like I said, going to change. Um, the fourth is, this is a tiny community and life is long. Don't be a jerk. I usually use a different word there. Um, uh, the world changes all the time, whether it's inside your company or outside. Um, and so being good to people, being known for being good to people, being known for being helpful and useful will serve you in all sorts of ways over time. Um, and like I said, uh, these are also my networking tips or whatever networking is, which is life is long and uh, one of the best things in the world you can walk out of scaling organizations with is a collection of people you definitely want to work with again. Um, so take the time while you're there to build relationships, find out who people are, find out what they're extraordinary at, and stay in touch with them. You never know what will happen over the course of life. Lesson number eight, it's going to be okay. If you think about the Legos metaphor, one of the most important things is all of those emotions and how often you cycle through that thing. It's actually normal. Um, and like I said, at some point, you can turn this into a skill where you just surf through the crazy waves. Um, we want to pretend that every day feels like this. But the truth is, like most days have moments that feel either like this or like this. One of the big things that I've learned over time, this is actually, by the way, part of Zen Buddhism, but we won't talk about that. Your first reaction is usually wrong. It is counterintuitive. The thing that you feel when you find out so-and-so is going to hire that guy and, or that girl and their job sounds a lot like yours and you have this like, what the moment or whatever, or like you hire an extremely talented people that should, a person that shouldn't work for you and you feel insecure about it, it's fine. Have the emotion. What and by the way, have the emotion. The emotions aren't wrong. What matters is what you do with them. If you go raging around like Godzilla trying to take back all the Legos and stake your territory or whatever, you will damage your own ability to grow inside this organization in ways that are hard to explain right now. But if you just sit with the emotion, it will pass it will move on. I, one of my big things is let me see if I feel this way in two weeks, and if I do, I'll do something about it. Your first reaction is usually wrong. It's also really important to focus on the long term. Usually those reactions are because today your job is defined as this, and today your scope is this. Every single job inside a scaling organization is growing as fast as that graph is growing, which means that every year your job grows 2x, 3x, 4x, 10x, whatever your user numbers or uh, team numbers are. Um, that means your job is getting bigger even if you just sit in the same chair, um, but also the entire company is getting bigger. So remember that you're part of that story. You need to focus on the long term, the stories you're going to get to tell. You guys will be up on this stage at some point being like, I built this thing. Um, and then also on the thing that you get to help to build. I know today it feels like this, but at some point you do get to be like, I started out building Bart's left shoe and now, you know, look at Bart or SpongeBob or whatever. The story you get to tell is actually one of the things that you get to leave and take with you into the world and help build other organizations and help other people that are going through this. The last is, for those of you inside truly scaling organizations, looking at all the Slack people, um, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. These things do not show up all that often. I say this all the time to the folks at CZI. You get to be part of building a once-in-a-lifetime organization. For anyone that has been inside these little baby companies like Quip, where you are fighting to matter and fighting to exist, you know that scaling is a privilege. Being able to hire all these people and grow is one of the greatest privileges in the world because lots of organizations don't get to do it. And yes, it's stressful, and yes, it's insecure making, but it is a privilege. Most days inside of baby startups feel like this. To have the opportunity to sit inside of that big pile of Legos uh, is actually a privilege, even if it's overwhelming and even if it's scary. 
Like I said, it is scary, but you get a job, a new job every three months. Most people spend two years doing the same thing, or 10 or 40, um, and you get to do something new every somewhere between three months, two weeks, and a year. This is the list of things that I ended up doing at Facebook alone. There's a whole other list from Quip and a, still another one from CZI. Um, I've had a goat rodeo of a career, and none of it makes sense, except that now I can stand up and pretend like it does. Um, and I think it's really important to understand that though Facebook may now seem like this really well put together tiger, the vast majority of the time there, it felt like this. It felt like many, many times like we were going to drive that thing off a cliff. Um, and like I said, now I get to talk about the tiger, and it seems like it's all very logical. But it was completely overwhelming and uh, very disorganized in its own way, and all of that was actually normal. All of that is what it feels like to build and grow and scale companies. Remember that you're lucky. Remember that having these experiences will eventually lead to stories, um, and take advantage of it. Um, don't let the roller coaster or the chaos get the best of you. Um, learn to give away your job and, and be open to what might show up next. So here we are again, the nine things I just mentioned. Um, one of the things that I just want to acknowledge is that when most people give career advice, they say, focus on your title, fight for your compensation, build a big team, it'll serve you well, and I just told you to do <laughs> All of the opposite things. I told you to give away your job, to focus on the learning, and to think about your time and your career as a story that you're building. And the truth is that that is um, the nature of scaling and building companies from the beginning. None of it is intuitive. A lot of the things that make sense or just are sort of historically true about careers, in fact, the opposite is true inside these organizations. So lean into it and have fun. Thank you, guys. Okay. We don't have time for questions, but um, if you guys want to reach out or ask questions, uh, you feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. Thank you. <laughs>